Hello, welcome to the Labor's Health and Safety Funds podcast webinar series. Today's topic, we're going to be discussing facial covering, respirators on the work site during this COVID pandemic. Today, we will discuss the differences between facial coverings and disposable and reusable respirators in the context of COVID and making a comparison between worker protection from other occupational hazards such as silica and hexavalent chromium, cement dust, beryllium, and wood dust. We'd also want to discuss the availability of N95s outside of the healthcare industry. Today, we have two guests with us to go over the matter. Dr. Sergio Caporelli from the Public Health Department of the University of Puerto Rico and Dan Glucksman from the International Safety Equipment Association. Dr. Corporelli holds a professorship and co is a coordinator position at the Industrial Hygiene Program from the Graduate School of Public Health of the University of Puerto Rico Medical Sciences Campus. He is an active member of the Puerto Rican Knowledge Coalition Coronavirus Team, and as such has offered training and guidance and clarification to the topic for respiratory protection, facial coverings, and other control measures for SARS-CoV-2. Dan Glucksman, longtime friend, is a public, air, public affairs director at the International Safety Equipment Association, a post he's held since, nine, since 2001. In his role, he helps implement regulatory and legislative policy goals developed by the board and its association members. ISCA, ISEA, excuse me, is the leading association for personal protective equipment and technologies that en enable people to work in a hazardous environment and an ANSI accredited standards development organization. The association works closely with manufacturers, test labs, subject matter expert, end users, and government agencies in the standards development process. So basically today we're gonna to be talking about respiratory protection and face covering and, and what their role is in terms of protection against lots of exposure. Very important for us to understand what are the currently accepted routes of exposure. We originally had the impression back in March that we had uh, only droplet exposures and contact exposure. Now, everybody agrees that there is another component, a third component, very important component as well, which is the airborne exposure. Because of that, we need to, uh, that's why we need uh, to understand each of these routes of exposures to see in which case either respiratory protection or face covering provides us with some protection. Okay, with that in mind, uh, we we're, there are two basic type of controls that address either cover and face coverings or respiratory protection. First one is physical barriers and the second one effective respiratory protection program. When we talk about physical barriers, that's where the cloth covering, the surgical masks fall in. They are not respiratory protection. They are not designed to protect the user. They're designed to protect everybody else but the user. They're very important, we, we understand. We are, the, the level of protection face coverings provide the user is very, but very low. They're designed to protect everybody else from the droplets, which is, Back to the picture, the middle one, the droplet, the large droplets that come out of the infected individual and may hit either the eye, the nose, or the mouth of the susceptible host. That's where the face coverings have some protection, some degree of protection. So if we take a look at that figure in the context of face coverings, just like you see here in the picture on the left, they provide the yellow color is associated with partially address. They partially address the routes of exposures that deal with droplets and contact. I mean, I cannot reach my mouth with the cloth covering paint put on, nor my nose if I have it properly put on, but I can reach my eyes. As it, but as you can see here on, on the top, it does not address any of the airborne exposure. It's very important to remember, face coverings, they do not address airborne exposure. They address partially 
droplets and contact exposure. When we looked at respiratory protection, we have different types of respiratory protection. We have disposable respirators, we have reusable respirators. Respirators, if they're properly used within an effective respiratory program following all the guidelines and requirements set up by OSHA to the construction industry or the, men, or the general industry, they will address airborne exposure. They will partially address droplets, equal or better than the face coverings, but they do not address the contact exposure because as you can see here, if I'm using half masks, I have my eyes open. If I use full face respiratory protection, just like the one shown in the picture on the left, and I'm sorry, my connection is poor, and it's for fine. some reason, it, it's difficult for you to see. I don't know why, but the full face here on the left, this type of protection will address properly airborne, droplet, and contact exposure because I cannot reach my eyes, my nose, or my mouth, and I can, and it will protect my respiratory protection, uh, my respiratory system. The other type of respiratory protection we sometimes see in construction industry is powered air purifying respirator, as the one that uh, should be shown here. For some reason, it's not shown. Sorry, right here. Hopefully, you see on the left the PAPRs, sometimes used for welding, sometimes used for other applications, just like sandblasting or something that requires a, a, a greater degree of protection will provide us protection for airborne droplet and contact exposure. Now it's very, uh, back to the difference between face coverings and respiratory protection, it's very important we understand that face coverings, they're not designed to protect the user. They're designed to protect everybody else. While respiratory protection is designed to protect the user. And on top of the figure, you see three types of respiratory protection. All of them are disposal respirators, an N95 without exhalation valve, one with an exhalation valve, and one that has also the ability to, to work as a surgical mask. We sometimes see people using them on the streets. However, whatever they find available, they'll buy. Now, everything on the lower side of the picture, including the one on the left, this is a dust mask I can buy in a grocery store or maybe a drugstore. This is not a respirator. It looks like one, but it's not a respirator. That is not designed to protect us against any hazards, nor the surgical masks, nor the face coverings, home or industrial made. These are all designed, the, the dust mask is is basically designed to protect us from, you know, household dust, no hazardous dust. And the other two, these are just made or designed to protect everybody else from the droplets a, the user is putting out from his or her mouth. Now, there has been uh, questioning about the use of an N95 with exhalation valve. And for that, I brought you a simulation for you to understand the behavior of each of these three pieces of equipment. On the left, you see an N95, no exhalation valve. On the center, you see an N95 with exhalation valve. And on the, on the right, you see a, a face covering or a surgical mask. The green dots you see on, on the screen are the aerosols. And this is a simulation using a particular program that you see on the bottom of the screen, okay? Over here, you see the aerosol is contained, and this is in a mode of exhalation. So the user is, exhalate, is exhaling air, and you see here the aerosol contained within the N95. Over here with the exhalation valve, you see some of the aerosol coming out, but with the face covering, a lot of the aerosol is coming out. And that is because the face covering or surgical mask is not designed to have a proper fit, a tight fit between the equipment and the individuals or the user's face. So when, whenever we look at these two pieces of equipment, we need to understand, and it's very important for us to understand, 
what are their purpose? So if I, if I am in a very uh, hazardous environment and I have only these two options, respiratory protection should be the option to select. Face coverings will provide a very small degree of protection in open areas, but since in open areas our risk is significantly lower, we don't see a lot of problems using face coverings around open areas. But in enclosed spaces, that becomes a higher risk, especially, of course, if we have an infected, non-symptomatic individual between us, among us. We don't know this individual doesn't have any high temperature, doesn't have any coughing, anything else, but maybe exhaling viral particles, active viral particles through the exhaled air. And as you can see over here in this simulation, we may have a risk if we are very close to the individual in enclosed spaces. Well, that uh, basically, uh, when we compare, and, and that's the last thing, the last slide I'm gonna show, SARS coronavirus 2, which is the virus associated with COVID-19 with other hazards. First of all, what we currently know about it is it is potentially severe in its, in its effect. And these effects are acute, so they happen almost immediately. It's highly contagious. It is associated with a significant percentage of infectious although asymptomatic individuals, so they don't show any symptoms, we don't know they are infected, although they are, and they are infectious to others. It enters the human body through contact with our eyes, nose, and mouth, and through our inhalation. And up to today, we do not know the infectious dose range really? of this virus. So we don't know what is the minimum amount of virus I need to inhale or touch and take to my mouth so I can get infected. So this is, this is the very uh, detailed information about this virus. Now, how do we compare that with silica, with asbestos, with hexavalent chromium, with beryllium? All of these hazards, they have chronic effects. All of them are, have severe effects, just like SARS coronavirus 2. Now, it's very different to have a perspective of, um, let's say, a fatality from asbestos exposure in 30, 30 years of exposure than to have a fatality due to SARS coronavirus 2 in 30 days. Both hazards kill. SARS coronavirus 2 kills in 30 days or less. So that perspective is very important for us to take home and think about it. It's not a continuous exposure that puts us in risk. It's an immediate exposure that puts us in risk. So care must be taken for us to protect ourselves in every condition, always, always taking into account the three routes of exposure, contact, droplets, and airborne. With that, I open to questions. Okay, uh, wow, Sergio, you have just mat uh, destroyed all the questions I have here by answering them in your presentation. So, fantastic. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic job, man. Um, I'll just cut right to the chase here. The, what, what you're basically saying is that back in March and early in the year when this virus pandemic took over this country, you know, our big concern was sick people getting uh, healthy people sick. So we begin to institute this policy of facial coverings, personal hygiene, and social distancing to prevent that from happening. And in construction, which the majority of folks that will be listening to this pod podcast will be from, that has kind of worked. We have not had major problems, but that's probably, as you alluded to, also associated with the fact that we are outside. Now that it's getting cold and we're going inside, so the majority of the, the percentage of activities going on outside will automatically increase. What do you think about a policy of us moving away from trying to protect our brother to requiring N95s on workers so that they're protecting themselves from others? 
I back it up 100%. Wow. That's where we're really at. Uh, I did not know. I knew, you know, as an industrial hygienist, how well N95s protect the wearer from hazards. It, but I did not know until your slide today how well it protects everyone else from the wearer. You know, the, the whole point that we're wearing facial coverings to protect the public from the wearer. So the ideal now is that we probably should be looking at trying to get wider access to N95s at a minimum. Would you say or no? Yes, I agree with you, Walter. But okay. I'd like to add that uh, we need to understand you know, N95 disposable respirators, the, the effectiveness of a respirator is made out of three very important components. And those that wear a respirator, they need to understand this, these three components. Without any of these three, the respirator use is not effective. The first is what everybody knows is the effectiveness or the efficiency of the filtering material of the respirator. In this case, an N95 has 95% efficiency in stopping aerosol particles of a very special size, 0.3 microns in aerodynamic diameter, which is a very difficult size of aerosol to stop. The second component, very important, you need to be properly fit to the respirator. So within, when I mention an effective respiratory protection program, part of that program is the fit testing. After you've been medically evaluated and you can wear a respirator, you need to be properly fit tested to the respirator you're going to be using. Okay, so the third, the third parameter is how long you use the respirator while you're exposed to a high risk. If you wear the respirator 50% of the time and everything else you're doing okay, that 95% lowers down to 42.5%. You understand what I'm saying? Really? All the factors, they are multiplied one by each other, by the other. So is the multiplication of these three factors that gives you what protection you have. No, no respirator will give you 100% protection. Wow, Sergio. That was awesome, man. Really awesome. Dan, I'd like for you to take off and, 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 and begin to talk about your experience with respirators, how our contractors can get more of them, where are they at, their availability, and any other thing you'd like to discuss with us about respir uh, respirators and ISC, ISEA. Sure. Um, the, uh, and I'll have some um, sort of segues or touch points to, to Sergio's comments. Um, so a lot of ISCA's members that make uh, N95 respirators, especially those who are, are domestic, um, and that is uh, you know 3M, Honeywell, and Moldex. Kimberly Clark is also a member. Uh, do have some kind of arrangement with um, the government through either the Defense Production Act or um, or some other arrangement to help boost production. Uh, in speaking with some members, um, respirator manufacturers, believe it or not, are supplying um, some of their industrial end users with uh, either 120% or in a range, 120% of what these industrial users um, used in 2019 and in some cases up to 300%. Um, the picture in with N95s does get a little opaque in that uh, FEMA is sort of the government distributor for the um, investments or contracts that HHS has made with respirator manufacturers. And once the respirators are shipped to FEMA, uh, it is unclear from the manufacturer's perspective about where those respirators go after that. But um, one of the things I wanted to tell, um, you know, members of laborers is that they and their employers should ask their industrial distributors about getting respirators. And I say that because uh, not unlike FEMA, a lot of times um, a large industrial distributor, you know, will under contract with the manufacturer, um, get their respirators. And in the nature of business, the distributors aren't telling the, um, the manufacturers who the customers are. 
Uh, but my main message to you is that manufacturers are shipping, you know, um, quantities of respirators to industrial distributors. Uh, in March and April, when a lot of factories shut down, distributors inked agreements with um, the one entity that was sort of open, had employees and needed them, that is the healthcare workplace. Uh, and one thing, um, Walter, I don't know is sort of like, what was the timeline of some of those early agreements? You know, were they six month agreements, year long agreements? Um, but a lot of industrial distributors sort of pivoted, kind of the key word these days, pivoted to um, healthcare because that's where um, sort of the customers were. And the best. Uh, but one thing um, to note as well as, as we're seeing right now is that surges in COVID are, are moving around the country, right? First it was New York, um, now it's the Midwest. And so if there's a construction site in a region or state that's not experiencing surge, um, again, both uh, the unions and their employers should ask their, you know, regional or that area distributor um, about getting access to respirators. Uh, also, ASTM is working on a standard which they call, <clears throat> or which would result in something called an N80 or an N60. And actually, personally, I don't like the fact that N in front of it because it kind of suggests there's some kind of NIOSH approval, but it'd be some kind of a mask that would provide um, an 80% efficiency, fil you know, filtration efficiency uh, using the NIOSH test method. So as Sergio noted, at that third of a micron, um, you know, particle level. Like a P1 filter. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the FFP, the European ones. Yeah, yeah. P1. Yeah, I think it, that's what it's in concept based on. Yeah. Uh, ASTM is developing this and they they will include some kind of fit test um, to the point of, um, you know, devices that fit closer to the face um, kind of let out fewer particles when someone exhales. That um, ASTM has the pedal to the metal on that. I know to the consternation of some of the people that are on that, that panel who are consistently trying to keep up. Um, and I think that we could see, or the wider health and safety community could see um, a ballot for that uh, going out towards the end of the year with possibly an approval uh, or a publication, I should say, of this, this ASTM um, barrier face mask standard um, in the early part of 2021. And the idea is for those people in, in, in the economy who, who need something. And here, let, let me reference um, Sergio's comment on the dose relation, dose response relationship. We don't know how many sort of um, coronavirus particles it takes to get sick. Uh, I think that the standard is sort of based on the fact that um, maybe it's a lot and not just one particle because certainly at this 80% efficiency level, if it's one you know, bug, one virus particle that gets you sick, then it's not as effective as if you need a really you know, large number of these particles. But so that I wanna recognize that, um, but hopefully those who think maybe restaurant or some people in the entertainment world that aren't um, in, uh, close contact with the public as, as others, maybe this would be okay for them. Um, my, and again, my only question, Dan, why wouldn't they be gobbled up as well? These N80 things? Yeah, because I the impression I get from your discussion is that manufacturers are making N95s and you're yeah. making tons of them and it's not really a lack of them being out there. It's the fact that there are entities greater than our construction contractors that are buying these things up before they can hit the market, whether that be FEMA or shadowy government organizations. And, um, and I've, I've heard about uh, production or, or the, the N80 uh, standard, but why wouldn't these same shadow organizations just gobble them up as well? Is there, 
you know, because under the Defense Production Act, I think yeah. everything's fair game, right? Well, uh, a couple things there. Um, it's possible that a lot of um, protective garment, or I should say protective garment manufacturers, companies that make the material for protective garments, um, and also, uh, you know, fabric and textile manufacturers that, you know, sort of don't have the, the industrial customers they had before COVID um, would now have or do have the material to make these, um, you know, these ASTM masks at the 80% efficiency level. So you have a lot more players. Um, okay. Naya, at least NIOSH has said they're not going to get involved in certifying these. So there'd be some non-governmental certification. And, and I don't know, but um, I can try to follow up with you about what level of conformity assessment or certification would be needed. Um, it's possible it's got to go to um, an up to snuff lab. I don't think they're going third party certification. Um, so at least you'd have more suppliers. Um, you know, the comment on the shadowy governments um, or shadowy suppliers, that's something that ISCA is trying to, um, and ISC members as well, are always kind of batting down. Um, for example, 3M has actually taken all well, thousands to court over um, either saying they've got access to 3M respirators or somehow they got some and they're marking them up beyond what you know 3M allows. And just a uh, personal note, you know, I got a crazy email from some entity saying they had thousands of 3M respirators and I immediately sent it to our 3M people and got an email shortly later from their fraud team saying, uh, you know, tell us, you know, more about this and, you know, they're tracking hey, it let's, down. let's follow that counterfeit and fraud thing. You know, and I'll read some of the questions I got from contractors concerning elastomeric or for most of my audience, reusable half face respirators and the N95s we're talking about up until this year were considered disposable single use. And the elastomerics are ones that are pretty much form fitted to your face with cartridges, both of which, uh, when I talk to contractors, uh, say uh, it, it, they see them, but it's difficult to buy. And But to be honest, the ones that they can buy are almost always counterfeit. Um, the cartridges themselves are car counterfeit. And they, they actually believe availability almost signals them being counterfeit. Like if they could get their hands on a few thousand, they know that they're counterfeits. I can't, I probably shouldn't tell you the stories that my affiliates have run into just trying to buy, you know, N95s for their members and the community. And then they come with the N95 stamp on them and they're counterfeit, which if they didn't have the N95 stamp on them, we could still use them as facial coverings, right? But because they have an N95 stamp on them and that means they may be used for the hazards that Sergio so eloquently outlined before, above, that um, that would be a problem. And I had in many cases advise our affiliates just to toss them because they we don't want them used as N95s being com, uh, counterfeit. And although it would have been helpful, and this was back when, you know, March and April when, when all hell was breaking out, but uh, we, we you really don't want a facial covering with an N95 either because then it will be misused. Uh, where has ISEA been involved in any of that? I, I guess they have, as you were just saying. Yeah, um, a couple of things. One, uh, NIOSH has been really great in terms of um, two things. One, helping large purchasers evaluate respirators before the purchase is made. Um, if a purchaser, you know, buying a large quantity can get even a dozen or so, NIOSH will, um, well, if it, if someone's claiming an N95 or NIOSH approval, NIOSH could tell you if. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've had to do that. Um, but, 
and maybe this goes a little bit off topic. I mean, I know some states that were buying, um, you know, non-NIOSH respirators. NIOSH was doing the evaluation to say, yes, you know, this product does have a high efficiency level. Um, so, so really, it's it's contacting NIOSH. Um, ISA members are trying to back down, you know, counterfeit offers or fake um, products, you know, when and where they can. So, and honestly, I will um, offer to flavors um, to be a of a funnel or a venue to both um, NIOSH, you've got that as well, and manufacturers to help identify whether or not the offers are, are real or not. Well, thank you. Um, but certainly it is hard. Uh, one member company, um, Ansel, who makes gloves and garments, yeah, they've got a warning on their site because they're seeing people add an extra N in the name or suddenly I know do like an Ansel dot EU or dot US and there are still just Ansel um, dot com with, with one L. I, I'm sorry, one N, uh, two L's, one N. Um, so honestly, um, it is hard and companies now have to work sort of overtime to not to find these frauds and counterfeits as well. But I think that's why it, it kind of take a partnership um, and we're happy to be partners in that. Now, all of this, we need to we need to see how OSHA expresses itself about it, about it. Because if the N80s will not be certified by NIOSH, the material, the filtering material, I don't know how OSHA will will see the use of respiratory protection literally stated as respiratory protection use, using a respirator that is not uh, who's, uh, which is ma filtering material is not certified by NIOSH. They will have to be expressing themselves about uh, they will have to have at least a temporary position for us as a as a society to move forward until we we see the end of the tunnel because um as as long as far as their regulation goes for respiratory protection this particular respirator would not qualify and they need to express themselves because we, re we really have a problem in our hands and we as a people need to resolve because it's not only now health workers that are in danger. Whenever we get our people working indoors because of the winter and with high asymptomatic individuals rate, it becomes a risk to work indoors without proper protection. Having said that, there may be some light at the end of the tunnel with some uh, ideas about a specific type of ventilation system that may help because general ventilation uh, works under the principle of diluting the air, diluting the air, so lowering the concentration. Since we don't know which is the minimum concentration, we don't know to how low we need to, look to lower the concentration to make it safe. So traditional air conditioning systems or even the ventilation the blowers we use for confined spaces are not the solution. There is a new concept, well, not new, but there's a concept we are evaluating as we speak, a blower throwing air into a cooling unit. So you, you wanna make the air cooler than the environment. Let's say you have four people working in this, in this room. They're maybe putting tiles or working on the electrical or whatever, okay? They're building, this, is, this room is under construction. So, the green duct here is fabric duct that you can lay down around the corners and it inputs cool air into the environment, very low speeds. And this air, as it touches workers and equipment, starts heating up and as it heats up, it goes up. So you're promoting a vertical movement of the air. So you're avoiding air going from somebody's mouth to somebody else's nose because that's what general Ventilation does. It mixes. And as it mixes, it reduces the, the concentration, but it spreads the concentration throughout the room. We don't want that. We want the air to move, get whatever you're exhaling and moving it away from everybody else. And this system would only control, any, any ventilation system would only control the airborne droplet nuclear uh, exposure. No droplet, no contact, only the airborne exposure. So the air moves, gets into the, the idea we're, we're proposing to study, gets into an exhaust plenum, 
it starts to be disinfected by UV on this false, false ceiling that you can assemble very quickly to do the work and then disassemble and take it off and then passes through a UV disinfection unit and goes back, recycles back to the fan. So you have a closed loop system that disinfects the air and you are providing ventilation to the people working inside and you may be reducing their risk of exposure. So again, this is a potential. It needs to be investigated, but as uh, we are looking- a lot of uh, sense from the science and uh, it's a closed system. And the cool air would be welcomed by everybody I know. Um, and that you could extrapolate this to a classroom where most classrooms in America are ventilated by open windows. And this would be a much better system. That uh, The fact that they could be using classrooms would be the reason it would probably be rolled out faster than for my guys. But still, this yeah. is amazing. So we can simulate what would be the exposure in each of the scenarios. So we could see if this system would be appropriate for uh, a construction scenario, a school scenario, a manufacturing scenario. I'm sure it wouldn't be appropriate for all scenarios, but I'm right. pretty confident that in many cases, we can at least reduce the risk to some level uh, that may be equivalent to where Wow, that, that's... That's some breaking news I got on my first video <laughs> podcast. This is so freaking cool. Yeah. Thank but you. Again, this, really this needs to be, this is in the process of review to be, to be seen if it's going to be funded or not. But this is an idea we've developed looking into the possibility of maybe uh, not needing to wear respiratory protection that, you know, uh, intensely, if this if this is a an equivalent solution, that would be that would be a great result. I mean, we need to see. Yeah. But it has some potential. Yeah, I just want to control it. over uh, PPE is always the way to go. I think we've pretty much um, you know handled the big issues here, and more importantly, we've actually come up with some solid solutions that coming into this presentation, I did not expect us to, to discover. I did not expect us to talk about the, the solution of the N80s and the uh, this new system that may be a little bit year away from us, but considering that this SARS is going to be with us for many years and their sisters and brothers, um, something to look forward to. So at this time, I want to really extend my deeply heartfelt thanks to Sergio and Dan for joining us. And I hope that we could do something else in the future, guys. Thank you very much. And with that, I'd like to sign off from the first ever uh, podcast. And I hope we have <laughs> another one at least as good as this one. Oh, my God, this was fun.